Job had it all. He was rich. He had not only hundreds, but thousands of animals. And back in Old Testament times, that was generally the way your wealth was measured, by how many animals you had. He had thousands of animals. Not only that, but he was blessed with a big family, 10 kids. And his kids seemed to be believers in the true God and faithful. Job regularly offered sacrifices for himself, for his kids. Not only did he seem to have it all physically, but God made amazing statements about Job. God said about Job, he is upright and righteous. There is no one like him on all the earth. In other words, God was saying that Job was the best believer on the earth, at least at that time. Wow! Can you imagine anything more cool than that? Than to say, God himself say, this is the best believer I've got. He had it all. Well, one day, the angels were somehow in concert with God. They were talking with God. And Hasatan, the Satan, is the way it says it in Job chapter 1 and 2. The accuser, the devil, was there along with. And God said to the devil, Hey, have you thought about my servant Job? He's great. He's upright and righteous. There's no one like him on the whole earth. And the devil's just mad. Well, yeah, of course. Look at all the stuff he's got. You've blessed him beyond reason. Of course he's going to be faithful to you. But if you bring some difficulty into his life, then he'll curse you. All right, Job. You, or, all right, devil. You can, you can have some free. And the next day had to be the most horrid day for probably anyone who's lived with the possible exception of Adam and Eve and Noah. The flood had to be horrid. And of course, grabbing that first fruit off of the tree was horrid. Three messengers come to Job, reporting on his flocks and herds. Sheep, oxen, donkeys, camels, all gone. Servants who tended them, all gone, except for the one who got to run. While he's contemplating that, he is now a completely broke man. While he's contemplating that, even worse news came. Your ten sons and daughters were all in a house feasting, and a fierce wind came and knocked down the house, and all ten were killed. Can you imagine a more horrible, horrid day than that? And what's Job's response? Tears his robes, that was a sign of mourning. And he said, naked I came into this world, naked I will leave. The Lord gave, the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And he worshiped God. Are you kidding me? Would I have done that? <laughs> I hope. <laughs> but I have my doubts. Job was amazing that he could worship God even in a circumstance like this. Wow. So some time later, we don't know how much, Again, the angels are presenting themselves before God and Satan, the devil, the accuser, is there along with. Have you considered my servant Job? God once again asked the devil. 
Well, yeah, it's because he still got his health. Take his health away, and then he'll curse you. All right, you can mess with his health, but you can't take his life. And Satan inflicted Job with boils, horrible boils. Said Job is a physical wreck. Takes potsherds and scrapes at himself to try to get himself some relief from these horrible boils. He's lost all of his monetary goods. He's lost all ten of his kids. Now he's lost his health. His wife comes to him and says, what is wrong with you? Curse God and die. Job says, I'm not going to do that. Three of Job's friends come. And they want to kind of comfort and encourage him. But at first, they're just kind of blown away by the whole thing. And so Job and his friends just sit there for like three days in silence. Kind of a just, you know, hang around with Job to try to kind of help him just by, by being there. And at the end of those three days, finally Job lets loose. He's frustrated. He's in pain. He's horribly in anguish. He finally just busts loose and he curses the day he was born. Why did God ever let me see the light of day? Why didn't God make me to be like a stillborn baby so I wouldn't have to go through all this stuff? And then his friends start talking to him. We'll put friends in quote marks. Because his friends don't help him much. What his friends basically say to him is this. Man, Job, you must be some horrid sinner. Because you wouldn't be getting it like this if you weren't some horrid sinner. I don't know what the horrid sin you did was, but man, you must be some horrid sinner. And doesn't the devil often go after you and me with that same accusation? Oh, you must have done something really bad. Oh, you know that sin that you committed back then. That's the reason you're going through this. Or, maybe it's the way the devil seemed to tempt Job in this instance. That the devil goes after you and me and says, This isn't fair. This isn't right. God is unjust. He's not treating you the way he ought to. He's not being loving and fair and kind and wonderful. You deserve better than this. Because that's the way Job goes. Job, find, Job says stuff like, I'm innocent. I demand a hearing with the Almighty God. And Almighty God, I demand that you put aside your almightiness for a minute so that I can face you in court and I can plead my case because this is not right, this is not fair. And the friends, of course, react to all that and keep saying, Job, you're just this horrid sinner. Confess your sin and then all this stuff will go away, which makes it as if somehow we controlled God, that if we repent to God, then God is forced to treat us really, really nice. No, 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 no. It's not the way God works. And after about 37 chapters... First there's the account, then there's Job, then there's the friend's responses, then one fourth guy comes into the mix and he's even worse than the other three. And finally in chapter 38, God steps into the mix. Then the Lord spoke to Job out of the storm. He said, Who is this that obscures my plans with words without knowledge. Stop and think what God is saying. God is saying, Job, you are clueless. And you would dare to question the way I rule the universe? Seriously? Well, and then if Job wasn't quite sure, God went on to give Job some examples. Brace yourself like a man. I'll question you and you'll answer me. Where were you when I laid the earth's foundation? Tell me if you understand. 
Who marked off its dimensions? Surely you know. Who stretched a measuring line across it? On what were its footings set? Or who laid its cornerstone? While the morning stars sang together and all the angels shouted for joy. Who shut up the sea behind doors when it burst forth from the womb? When I made the clouds its garment and wrapped it in thick darkness. When I fixed limits for it and set its doors and bars in place. And when I said, this far you may come and no farther. Here is where your proud waves halt. How do you think Job felt? <laughs> yeah, I'm guessing like about that big, huh? Hey, Job, I decided to create the earth one day. Do you know how I did it? Well, I know you said let there be, but past that I have no clue. Hey, Job, I decided how big the earth should be. Do you know why I made it as big as it is? No. <laughs> hey, Job, uh, I was the one who decided to put stars up into the sky. And oh, by the way, I made angels and allowed them to be able to sing. Do you know how I did that? No. Hey, Job, I decided where there should be dry ground and where there should be seas and lakes and rivers and oceans. Uh, do you know how I decided that? Do you know why I decided that? Do you know the value of why I did it that way? Uh, no. <laughs> oh, really? And you would question me? And by the way, God goes on like this for about another chapter and a half. My brothers and sisters, this is one of the sections of Scripture that reminds us of something that we need to be reminded of over and over, and that is the fact that there is a God in heaven and you are not it, nor am I. He is all-powerful, he is all-wise, he is all-knowing, he owes explanations to no one about anything, and that includes me, and that includes you, and that includes Job. Because at the end of the day, he is God. The disciples got a little reminder of it in the boat on the Sea of Galilee that day, didn't they? Raging storm is going on. A lot of these guys were fishermen. They'd been caught in storms before, undoubtedly. This one's bad. Lord, don't you care that we're going to drown? Not this day. Jesus, with perfect faith in his heavenly Father, sleeping in the stern, gets up, be quiet, be still. And immediately the winds and the waves go to absolute quiet. And what do the disciples say? Who is this? Even the winds and the waves obey him. Yeah, who was that? That was the almighty ruler of the universe <laughs> who was sitting in the boat. And that's why the winds and the waves obeyed him. My brothers and sisters, the disciples needed that storm. Why did they need that storm? Because it brought them to a much greater appreciation of who Jesus was. That he was the all-powerful God. That he was indeed the ruler of the universe who controlled all things. which of course in turn was going to eventually lead them to a much greater appreciation for Jesus' sufferings and death. Because who was it that was hung up there on that cross? It was the almighty ruler of the universe. 
Because my brothers and sisters, the almighty ruler of the universe, who owes no one anything, has chosen to give you everything. He chose to lay aside the full use of his powers as God. Oh, he still had them. If he wanted to tell the winds and the waves to be quiet, he could, and he did. But usually he didn't. He laid aside the full use of those powers. Why? Because he loved you. And because he loved me. Because he was willing to go to a cross for you and for me in order to win forgiveness of sins, life, and salvation for you and for me. And now can you imagine? The Almighty God who decided how to put the earth into its orbit and decided how to put the solar system together, think about that for a minute. How much brains would it take to figure out how to build a solar system? <laughs> that God who has that kind of wisdom, who has that kind of power, is on your side. And he loves you dearly. And knowing that, knowing that my God is all-powerful, knowing that my God is all wise, and knowing that my God loves me dearly. You have it all. Amen? And amen.